hymn is one of the Psalms, many of which were written by David, and this one is attributed to him. We're following David's story over the summer, and we've met him as the promising young shepherd, uh, chosen as the future king. We've seen him as the gallus laddie who took on the giant Goliath and beat him by thinking outside the box. We've wept with him when his friend Jonathan and his father, King Saul, were killed in battle. And even though David and Saul had been enemies, David still respected him. Well, today we pick up the story after years of civil war between Saul's remaining sons and David, each trying to take over the kingdom with so much blood, bloodshed and plotting and shenanigans. Liz is going to share a reflection on how David planned and plotted to take over what had been promised to him so many years before. Then we'll hear the story from the Bible read by Pauline. Uniting a Kingdom, part one. How to create a united kingdom or a united parish or a united government or a, you get the idea. Start modestly, rise to the leadership of one tribe. Keep up with some fighting with the other tribe. Lots of fighting, wear them down. Grow stronger. See the other side weaken. Stand back while your chiefs and their chiefs destroy each other. Keep clear of any blame. I listen as the other side. No, that's not what it says. It's a bit How to create a united kingdom or a united parish or a united government or a, you get the idea. Start modestly. Rise to the leadership of one tribe. Keep up some fighting with the other tribe. Lots of fighting. Wear them down. Grow stronger. See the other side weaken. Stand back while your chiefs and their chiefs destroy each other. Keep clear of any blame. Listen as the other side gradually realises that you are destined to rule all sides. Wait. While they work out, there is nowhere else to go for security and protection. Let them come to you. Hear them tell you that even in the reign of their last leader, you were superior. You were greater. You are the one to take charge from now on. So take charge. Make an agreement and accept their anointing of you. Surely. These are signs of success. Go one step further. Give your name to the capital city. Then occupy it. Let there be no doubt that God is with you. Serve a full term. In fact, stay at the top until you die in day. That's how to do it. Now go and enjoy your united kingdom. 
The reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 5, starting at verse 1. David becomes king of Israel and Judah. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said to him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even when Saul was still our king, you led the people of Israel in battle, and the Lord promised you that you would lead his people and be their ruler. So all the leaders of Israel came to King David at Hebron. He made a sacred alliance with them. They anointed him and he became king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king and he ruled for 40 years. He ruled in Hebron over Judah for seven and a half years and in Jerusalem over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. The time came when King David and his men set out to attack Jerusalem. The Jebusites who lived there thought that David could not be able to con conquer the city. And so they said to him, you will never get in here. Even the blind and the crippled could keep you out. After capturing the fortress, David lived in it and named it David's city. He built the city around it, starting at the place where land was filled on the east side of the hill. He grew stronger all the time because the Lord God Almighty was with him. time between Saul's death and David's anointing as his successor really was marked with much bloodshed and plot and counterplot and some of it's not exactly edifying. The characters in the story don't naturally shine with godly virtues. Not even David who comes across as a power hungry warrior desperate to consolidate his kingdom. Makes me wonder where God is in the story. And then the last line of the Bible story that we read today says, the Lord God Almighty was with him. That just poses so many questions for me. Was God okay? with all the bloodshed and intrigue? Did God sanction the murder of opponents and the sacking of cities? Did the end justify the means? It, it seems to me more like David had set God to one side in his lust for power and conquest. He seems to depend more on military prowess than prayer. Retribution happens more often than forgiveness. What's going on? I have to keep asking this because of that last assertion that God was blessing David. It jars with me and, and many other people when we think of peace and justice and compassion as more like God's ways than this. I guess the best I can make of it all is that David brought God's people together and ushered in a time of stability and prosperity that allowed them to develop their faith and shape ours. It also laid the foundations for the descendant of David, who was Jesus. But maybe wrestling with these questions about David leads us into other questions of a more contemporary nature like is it right for a government to award contracts to friends if it means we get the PPE we needed? Was it better to get the job done or to fulfil all the demands of tendering? Or is it okay to cut back on foreign aid if there's a great need at home? 
what comes first? Keeping the Northern Ireland Protocol or supplying the people of Belfast for British sausages? You see, there's no real right or wrong answers to these questions. There are subtleties and nuances in our answers to all of them. And we need to decide whether we stick with immovable principles or look to what the outcome might be and get there at any cost or somewhere in the middle. But the church is facing these kind of questions too. The Church of Scotland has for several years been trying to weigh up whether to move out of its Edinburgh offices for something new and modern or to keep a building which is accessible to most folk because of where it is and all of that against the background of a cut in ministry numbers. Our own congregations grappling with keeping church buildings in every part of the parish or selling them and having what we can manage and what we can sustain in 10 years time. Could we become a church without walls? Or maybe we should link up with the other churches in our cluster and make one large church for the whole area, which is right. And we're all trying to work out uh, impossible questions about when restrictions are lifted. Do we go back to the way it used to be? Or can we change things? And if so, what? Will we go back to driving everywhere and flying around the world? Or will we have learned that the world needs us to do less of that? And it needs time to recover. Will we want to reconnect to everyone we used to know? Or are there people that we might just want to let go? How will they feel? Will we buy local to help businesses get back on their feet or go totally online and buy everything from China? What's right? What's not? What will the effect be on us? David brought in a new era for the people of God and they saw him with hindsight as their greatest king. But he got there through violence and power. His descendant, Jesus, was different. Jesus declared that his kingdom was a different thing altogether. He turned away from power and resisted violence. The violence was done to him. And in the end he overcame it. Jesus didn't wrest power from others but offered a new way, based on love and compassion, on justice and peacemaking. Jesus showed a kingdom where the least, the forgotten, the marginalised, were brought in and given a fair share. Jesus brought healing instead of harming, reconciliation instead of retaliation. I can't help but feel drawn more to his blessing than to his ancestors. Let us pray. Dear God, we know that you love us. Thank goodness that will never change. But how can we know that we are on the right track? That we are doing your will and not our own? that you are proud and pleased with our actions? Is it when other people tell us how great we are? Is it when all our plans succeed and churches grow? Is it when we feel most confident and our faith is secure? Or is it, could it possibly be when all around us is crumbling and we still keep holding on, when no one understands and we feel most alone, when we are least proud of our actions, least confident in our own abilities and the best choice is to trust in you. God, our strength and our refuge, Holy Spirit, 
the encourager. Jesus, our companion and our forever friend, may we know that you are with us always. Amen. Thank you.